Hi, my name is Ted Knutson. I'm the CEO and founder of StatsBomb. And we had a little hole in our content this week on StatsBomb.com, so I decided to, to fill this in with uh, a keynote, uh, keynote speech that I gave at a conference called CASIS uh, this summer. <clears throat> I was kind enough to be invited out there uh, to do a presentation on this and also to the joint statistical meetings where I did a different presentation. Um, today you're going to get what's called a presentation I call Radar Wars. Um, I'm going to do it basically like I did in the room. So if there's any cheesy jokes that you don't understand, uh, that was probably for somebody in the audience or it was just bad. Anyway, here we go. So I'm happy to be here at CASIS. Uh, I was here two years ago. I think CASIS and Nessus are probably two of the best sports stats conferences you can go to. Um, last year, or last time around that, when I came to this, uh, I kind of signed up for it and then found out that Kirk Goldsbury was the keynote speaker. Um, and I find Kirk to be a, an amazing sort of, uh, he's produced amazing work, uh, a great example. Um, I was really excited by it. Uh, it was like showing up and, and all of a sudden there was a rock star that was gonna be on stage uh unexpectedly now the set list possibly could have been a little more sexy because you know kirk was going to talk about mapping but nevertheless it was a, a really exciting moment and i thought his speech was great uh for those of you who were at Cassis the last time all i can say is that prepare to be wildly disappointed so my presentation today is entitled radar wars um it, it comes about on the back of a, a story that i'll tell through through this um mostly luke bourne's fault but it comes back to some ideas that i think are really important in in sort of sports analysis um which is why i'm presenting it today and the the big splash is, is lovely so thanks to our team for the artwork on that <clears throat> so my name is ted knutson i grew up in the chicago area i am an unfortunate bulls and bears fan um white Sox fan as well and uh, I became an Arsenal fan when I started watching football, which was great for a while and uh, sometimes less great recently. Uh, I spent about 10 years in professional gambling, um, doing trading, um, developed live sports, uh, redeveloped the soccer department at PinnacleSports.com, helped rebuild Pinnacle over, over time. And these days um, I live in Bath, uh, which is a lovely small city in the southwest of England, um, as you can see the weir there. Uh, and founded StatsBomb, which is where we're located. So we're we're based in in Bath itself. So today I'm going to talk about radars. And for me, this journey starts with a guy named Rami Mo, who produced these really cool uh, NBA radar or sorry, NBA All Star posters for the All Star game. And kind of he was looking at different profiles of of minutes and output um, for the NBA. And what was interesting was that. I looked at this and I thought, well, that'd be really cool to do in, in a soccer slash football context. Um, yeah, I love, I found the, the visuals very striking and, you know, much like when you see something really cool, you want to copy it. Well, this was kind of that, but I thought that we could adapt it to our sport. Um, what he did here is way less sort of technical and scientific than, than where we ended up with, but it's still this most beautiful design uh, set. And so, you know, a lot of the credit, or at least for my journey on this, goes to, to Rami Mo. However, um, you know, the, the early days are often fraught with mistakes. So you can see these, these were like literally the Messi and Ronaldo ones were the first things that, that I created, um, you know, kind of throwing different metrics up there that I thought were interesting and, and a bit copying the, the NBA ones. Um, on the, the right-hand side there, you see Messi versus Joe Average, which was much further along in the process. We started to add overlays into it to compare different players or players to average. Um, a lot of the stats have changed from research and the boundaries have changed, but we'll get to that. So this is my early stuff and, you know, it's not perfect. <laughs> what we found out as part of this early work was that when you leave the absolute boundaries in, Messi makes every single person in the world look average or that is average look terrible. And, and that was a problem with these. So, you know, you, you, you explore, you revise, you iterate, you revise, hopefully you make them better. But what's interesting is that radar slash spider charts in soccer are really old. Uh, I did some research on this and found out that um, you know, the earliest ones that people had seen were in pro evolution soccer uh, or in, in Japan, it was called winning 11 for a while. And what's interesting is that, you know, I think 
someone told me that they had them in, in either Pro Evo 1 or Pro Evo 2. I couldn't find a screenshot of that, but this is Pro Evo 3 in 2003. So we're talking about literally you know 10 years before Remimo's stuff was, was out there that I saw. Somebody had been messing around with these inside of soccer at that point. Pretty cool. Um, so someone decided a long time ago, back in the early days of, of visualization work, that, that these started to make sense for, for this particular sport. Now, my argument is that they make sense for a lot of sports, but you know, your, your opinion on this may be, may be different than my own. <clears throat> so like, we're going along, and I've created these things, and we're getting a lot of feedback uh, from people on social media that radars are pretty good and we found professionally that they were pretty good as well These are more modern radars. They come from our, our stats bomb IQ platform Which is a data analytics platform that you know teams from the Champions League down into to League one currently use uh, in around the world uh, in football so these are like the modern versions we use these to go through something like a thousand player evaluations over the course of a year when I was at Brentford and Michelin. So I worked inside of football for two seasons. Uh, we did a lot of the recruitment work there and they provided a, a great way to, to get an idea of the skill set of a player and whether or not they were you know, possibly good or bad. And the biggest thing in soccer, which may be different than other sports, is that you go through so many players and just finding out which ones are bad and you shouldn't spend any time on is massively valuable because it, it gives you the ability to um, re, uh, redistribute your time in a more efficient way. So we're going along and radars are good and everything's happy and social media is happy. And then out of nowhere, Luke Bourne comes up with this, uh, this tweet that he's plagiarized, by the way. So, you know, he's plagiarized it already, you know, to, typical of Luke's work, all these things that he's appearing, these magical, uh, new papers that he's publishing at things like Sloan, you know, well, he's not, beyond plagiarizing a tweet, let me tell you. Um, so, so Luke has stolen this from, from a guy named Stat Sam, uh, his name's Sam Vertura, on why radar plots are misleading. And he says the eye focuses on area, not length. Now Luke doesn't even have a thousand followers on his account last time I checked, but he's got like over a thousand retweets for this random radar tweet. And uh, so like, I'm just here minding my own business and Luke comes up with this. And then all of a sudden, Daryl Morey with a drive-by, says no analytics person worth his salt uses radar plots or pie charts or two Y axes. Probably more if I think on it, all super misleading. Now I can tell you that I don't use pie charts. <laughs> and uh, obviously I use radars. Uh, so so Dale does a drive by and basically calls the entirety of my analytics career into question. Uh, which, you know, that's, that's, that's fine. I like Dale, Dale's a nice guy. Um, so, so if that's not bad enough, <clears throat> we've got these guys who are quite renowned in the world of basketball and analytics who are questioning the idea and the use of radars. And I'm thinking about it. I'm like, all right, well, what do I think? You know, because I've kind of tied myself to this and I think that they're good. And I actually spent like a good six months of my life really investigating and learning about data visualization before I even produced these things. And they're still out there. And I produced them knowing that they were issues with the, the visualization type and that there were weaknesses, etc. And so I came back to it and, and we're examining our priors as we do in, in sort of a statistical Bayesian world. And, and this is a, a picture of, of Michelin in 2014-15 uh, as they win the title. So we're examining our priors here and this man is a nerd with a trophy and this man is me. So I have a trophy uh, and I like radars. So that we're, we're in good shape here. Now let's, let's, let's look at the other people. Let's look at the critics of radars. Crit critics of Raiders have no trophies right now. That's, uh, you know, that, that feels good to me. I, I'm all right with this. Like, I've got a trophy. These guys don't. You know, clearly, this is this is where we're going with uh, Raiders are good. Uh, except this one fatal flaw, which is that the guy who wrote the original tweet, Stat Sam, his name's Sam Ventura. And not only does Stat Sam have a trophy, he has two with the Pittsburgh Penguins. Hockey's pretty cool, too. So Sam doesn't like radars, and he's got two trophies, and I have one trophy. And if that's not bad enough, to make matters worse, <laughs> days later, Edward Tufty chimes in, and he says, "Glyphs in general have this problem, you know, over the top of Luke's tweet." Uh, it goes back to Bell Labs RNS graphics 30 years ago. Glyph codes are often a one-off, a drag for viewers. So um, uh, you may not know who Edward Tufty is. Um, people who have looked at a lot of visualization stuff and studied this probably do but 
the Edward Tufte, the, the Don of DataViz, um, his visual display of quantitative information is one of the primary textbook materials in learning about data visualization. Uh, a landmark book, a wonderful book, a tour de force, the century's best book on statistical graphics, and if that's not enough, quote unquote, best 100 nonfiction books of the 20th century. Amazon.com. So we were doing just fine here. We were, we've got a trophy. Radars are good. They're popular. And then all of a sudden, uh, yeah, we, we, StatSam has trophies. Uh, Edward Tufte, the Don of Database, says that, that they're bad. Um, so like, let's think about this for a second, right? Why would someone who is allegedly smart, like me, choose this terrible visualization platform to present player statistics on, knowing that there are weaknesses. And the secret here is that every visualization has trade-offs. Um, I've tried to, to put the sources on here from the places that I found them, but every single, especially player visualization and player comparative visualization that we, we see has different types of trade-offs. This is a warrior chart um, or hero charts, depending on on who's, who's done them. They're comparing different NHL players, kind of drags your, your eyes from side to side, screen to screen. You've got stack bar charts, which Daryl loves. Um, lots of people love. One of the problems that we have in, in soccer is that like there aren't really equivalencies in most of the stack bar charts, so they're difficult to produce outside of the scoring stats and or um, some of the defensive stats that you can kind of combine to say that we think these are the same. But really, they're not. They're actually different skill profiles in intercepting or tackling or pressing or whatever. Uh, so you got stack bar charts here. They're, they're nice. They we we use them. I, I will say, like <laughs> people people always think that that we th use radars almost exclusively in Stats Bomb and Stats Bomb IQ. And the fact of the matter is, like it's a small thing that we do, and most of the time we just leave them alone. Occasionally we'll revisit, like literally every two years or something like that, we revi revisit them. Um, but it's the type of thing that you know you get known for and then everybody's like oh they're the radar dorks well we are but like we have tons of other visualizations and if you follow our social media you'll see that as well so you got stack bar charts here uh, this is michael Cayley stuff <clears throat> you've got dot distribution plots uh this is neil charles a lot of people kind of copied these um you know you can have your own opinion about them if i you know if i look at these like i think think that there are a bit of problems there we might redesign them they're interesting um but they are not the thing that we ended up with and didn't choose. You've got sort of normalized fans and polar coordinates, and I'm seeing more of these kind of in the analytics space recently. Um, one of the reasons why I chose to do radars, and, and you see actually on Steve's, he, he he's done it as well, is like I wanted to produce real numbers. I wanted people to be able to to talk about these numbers and compare them and have like something to talk about, not like he's in the 95th percentile, because that's really a bit esoteric and removed from it. I grew up with baseball cards and we'd be able to talk about how, you know, Tony Gwynn had like a 308 average in, in this season. And you couldn't do that if you, if you just put the percentiles out there, um, you know, fans have their own thing. They're not bad. Um, you know, some people have made kind of normalized radars or fans as well. You know, as I said, everything has strengths and weaknesses and you're making choices, active choices when you pick not only your visualization format, but then all the things that you do inside of it. You've got parallel coordinates. Now this is gorgeous. And some people like to do this with, you know, three or four players, you'd be able to, to sort of see how they compare on this. Now, I don't have, I don't have a strong opinion about this. Um, you know, they could be really attractive. It does. Yeah, I've seen them used well a few times, but I, they're not a thing that we've chosen necessarily either. Um, so one of the things to, to be cognizant of in the, in the sports analytics space is, you know, coming back to this idea and um, these concepts is like, are you a king? So Daryl's a king. Daryl runs his team. He's able to have strong opinions about stuff. He's got like a huge legacy of, of strong work. He's, he's, his rockets are part of the move that has literally changed the game of basketball and how they play and stylistically how they do things. And I'm certain that that style was largely generated from the fact that they did analysis saying that this is a better, more efficient way to play. And that's based on stats and data. And we can do that in football too. But one of the things that, that you have to be aware of is like, you know, Daryl is a king. And so he gets to have strong opinions and then, and then other things can happen. So Daryl, uh, during the world cup, <clears throat> Someone asked him a question, should soccer players pass back to the goalkeeper? 
Uh, absolutely not. Dumbest play in all of sports that is done on a regular basis. Risk high, reward negligible. Um, so Daryl has this strong opinion. And I live in Europe. And on Sundays, I attend the church of Josef Guardiola, Latter-day Saint. Um, so this king is basically questioning our God. And, and, and Pep is, is basically the patron saint of modern, modern football. There is no one on the planet that is as successful and probably as good as Pep Guardiola. And I have seen many, many times that Pep's team passes back to the goalkeeper. Uh, so Daryl has this extremely strong opinion. He's questioning something that, you know, we would look at as the sort of biggest indicator of, hey, this is, you know, something that probably has an edge in it. Um, in passing back to the goalkeeper and Guardiola does this constantly. So, you know, you've got these competing kings that have these ideas. Now, Daryl says that passing back to the goalkeeper is bad and we decided to look at this because I hadn't really seen this kind of contention. Um, you know, Daryl works in basketball. He probably knows a lot about a lot of different sports. The Sloan Conference has tons of different sports. Maybe he knows more about esports as well than, than most people that I, I would ever interact with. Um, so we're going to work the problem here. Uh, the top three teams in EPL in 1718 and passes back to the goalkeeper were Chelsea, who did 648 times, Manchester City, who did 635, and Liverpool, who did it 621 times. Now, this is the 1718 season. Um, the goals scored from moves involving a pass back to the goalkeeper by these teams. So Chelsea scored three, Man City scored 12, and Liverpool scored nine. So we're clearing scores we're clearly scoring goals as part of moves that involve a pass backwards to the goalkeeper and then move forward. So like this is an important part of the move. It doesn't cut it down to say that you immediately give the ball away. In fact, these teams have scored quite a few goals over the course of the season as part of passing back to the goalkeeper and then moving it forward again. Now the goals scored against these teams from passes back to the goalkeeper. So this is when the team, um, the, the opposition snuck in and was able to get the ball back effectively or steal the ball away from the goalkeeper because they made a mistake. Uh, we looked at it and the goals scored against these teams, which is what Daryl was complaining about, saying it was very high risk, came down to this. So we'll play it again. You can see this is Manchester City. They're up 3-1 the end of the game. It looked like Otamendi tried to pass it back to his goalkeeper and it didn't make it back off of, off of his chest. And I think it's Rondon who sneaks in and gets the goal. That was it. So out of the three highest volume teams and passing back to the goalkeeper, there were three plus 12 is 15 plus nine is 24. There were 24 goals scored and there was one conceded by these teams. Now, Daryl would say that we're possibly cherry picking this, right? And so he would also say that we're not analyzing this well enough because we don't have tracking data to evaluate every possible option available to the players to say that, you know, you shouldn't pass back to the goalkeeper. There are these other options you need to see. That's kind of fair, but really, if you've got a, contra a contrarian opinion that also contrasts with what the most successful coach in the game does, we should be finding some sort of evidence to say that you might be right. And what we're finding is that not only in the small sample of the high volume teams, and the reason why I just told, chose high volume teams is because I was going on holiday uh, to actually come to this conference and give this, this talk. Uh, so we only did that. But when we looked at the rest of the league, we also didn't see that many goals scored uh, or goals conceded by part of moves that were either back to the goalkeeper or intended to go back to the goalkeeper. I think the highest that we saw in uh, in the Premier League was two goals conceded as part of those. And then we actually looked down a league. And the reason why we did this was because we wanted to say, okay, there are low quality players there. Also, we have pitch problems. So we looked down at League One, uh, where we had data to analyze this. And we found that Oldham were actually quite bad and they had conceded four goals off of either passes back or intended passes to the goalkeeper over the course of last year. But that was the most that we saw. We also saw like on a per game basis, there were far fewer passes back to the goalkeeper in league one than they were in the Premier League. So like it might be a thing where not only is it a skill factor, a pitch factor, but also a decision-making factor. Like these players have generally been been coached well enough to be able to, to make these choices. Uh, 
this year so far, and I'm recording this well after the Cassis conference, but I can say that that it looks like Allison is going to screw me right out of my my comfort zone in this in this analysis, where you know he he's decided to play around with the ball a lot at goalkeeper, and you know in some ways you know you get a sombrero out of it, in other ways you get a mistake, but the mistake might have been caused by positioning of his defenders so that he couldn't pass to them. Uh, anyway, w this is an ongoing thing, but the reason why I talk about this is because Daryl can walk into a room and have a strong opinion and state the strong opinion and then you know people are like huh that's really interesting let's investigate this if i walk into this room or if any of you out here or the vast majority of you walk into a room and you state this type of strong opinion to a director of football or to a head coach or anything like that you might not be asked to walk into that room again and that's something that you need to be aware of. Like Daryl gets to be able to say these strong opinions because you know he's got this huge career and he runs his team. Almost none of you are actually going to end up running a team. And I'm not saying that because like you know you're not very talented. It just doesn't happen very often. So it's likely that instead of being a king, you're going to be an influencer. And as an influencer, there are things that you need to be aware of when you walk into a room and you can't just say crazy, op strong opinions all the time or even like very often at all, because it will degrade some of the credibility that you're afforded, even if you're right. So I bring up defense or influencer status to show you a visualization that we developed from a statistician's perspective, what I wanted to define with this visualization was where teams are defending. So we built a defensive activity map and we broke it into zones and these zones largely correspond to what would be called Wego di Bezision. Um, and I'm sure that my pronunciation is terrible there, but yeah, deal with it. Um, so like there's five zones across the pitch and then three zones on, on each side of the halfway line. And this largely corresponds to how these coaches and many coaches view the game. Like you've got the half spaces, you've got the central zone, you've got the, the wings of the wide spaces. So the defensive activity map looks at where teams are trying to defend on the pitch. Each defensive action has a dot. Um, so we've, you know, we've granularized all the defensive actions over the course of a season. And colors are based on whether you're significantly higher or lower than the league average in that zone. An immediate problem that you see if you are a mathematician or statistician is that you will get overfitting by zones, and in some cases significantly. Like this is a, a 19 games played by Los Angeles Football Club. Um, we don't really have enough data for this to fit properly. There's going to be a lot of error inside of it, especially in the higher zones where where high presses happen. Um, it's overfit, and and the math on it doesn't cooperate very well. The unfortunate counterpoint to the correct statistical feedback here is that the coaches who we need to influence to survive really liked this viz. And so I introduced it to, to some of the coaches and they're like, this looks great. And then we started talking about the weaknesses. I'm like, it needs almost half a season of information for, for it to be able to sort of stabilize and give you useful stuff. And you know, we've, we've designed something that's really nice, but unfortunately isn't super utility, uh, useful until much later in the year, which in the football season doesn't actually uh, help you that much. <laughs> but because I'm a cheaty data company owner now, um, what we did was we, when we were redesigning this viz or designing the data actually, um, I wanted to start to see where pressure is because you know you've got these two things that are going on you've got defensive actions in the old style which is effectively um tackles and interceptions and maybe some fouls and you can add some other things in there but that's kind of where we were at with those um maybe some duels <clears throat> where you're attempting to to do something um and we added pressures into those and what we're seeing with pressures is we're getting about 300 additional events that are not on the ball, they're where someone is trying to defend. And suddenly with those 300 additional events per game, we don't have the problem with overfitting anymore. We get a lot more information uh, about where teams are trying to defend and it becomes uh, a pretty useful viz now. So it's you, you probably won't encounter this very often where you're able to, to take something that doesn't quite work how you wanted to, but it was a good idea and coaches actually like it and then add a whole bunch of new data that fixes the, the mathematical problems that you had before. But the idea here is that you you need to do things and listen to your audience because they are the landing point. And if you need to influence them, as opposed to being able to just say things and then have people figure out if, if they're right or not, 
like this is a big deal in in your job <laughs> quite quite frankly or your your progress you know whether it's media or otherwise in in gaining an audience and and working that way so back to radars we're still on these like all these weaknesses these guys the that are really high powered very intelligent people criticizing it and we're still using them why so i thought i'd go through some bullet points on this first of all our radars aren't an open system like when we've done these we decided to to take the metrics and use the same metrics consistently on what we call a template for a position based template so like we're not just slapping different metrics on there uh sort of willy-nilly to to throw things on and, and do comparisons that's not how it works it's not an open system these are consistent the metrics are carefully grouped in place next to similar neighbors so that we get to see kind of a skill set in this area um so like there's almost like subdivided areas of this and Part of that, what that does is it, it creates shapes and similar shapes indicate easily recognized player types or archetypes. So, you know, some guys are messy and there's really only one actually that's messy, depending on what your, your boundaries look like. Um, and then there are other guys that are, you know, wide forwards that have, uh, are very dribbly and some are not very dribbly, they're creative wide forwards. Um, you know, we've got defensive midfielders on one side, we've got attacking midfielders on the other side of the, the midfielder uh, plot. You know, it, it does it does create like easy visual clues for you to understand this is probably what this player looks like. Um, we also normalized it by population. So we've got the inner ring is like the bottom 5% and then the, the outer ring, if it touches that, it's the 95th percentile. And the reason why I did this was because it gives you um, a grounding without using the you know, without breaking it into percentiles, it gives you an idea of like basically two standard deviations from the average of the population and how well this player is performing. So again, we're, we're kind of giving you a bunch of visual clues and in some cases, sciencing the shit out of it uh, in order to, to give you uh, an easier, faster interpretation of how good this player's performance is in these different metrics that we've, we've slapped on there. Another thing that's really useful in the real world in, in applying this type of stuff is they are fast. Like we're able to go through these very quickly. Now, this isn't the end of our analysis. This is often the beginning of the analysis. Like you get a bunch of scouting names and you look at them and, you know, plenty of these, you know, sometimes we get like during transfer weeks or, or close to the close of end of uh, the transfer season, like you get, you know, two emails a day that have 10 players on them. Like, so that's 200 players in some cases as you go throughout you know the last two weeks of the season from agents saying hey look at this guy hey look at this guy hey look at this guy they're all shopping these players and and we need a way to go through them quickly and effectively and if you have to scout that that is just a brutal drain on your scouting resources or you just don't end up with useful information entirely possible so these are fast and we found them super useful because of that um and then you know the last two points on here are that we found through lots of experimentation and lots of interaction with our target audience, either of coaches or of people on the internet who are fans or whatever, that people really love them. And that's important because you want people to, the visualizations or the analysis that you're presenting, you want them to engage with it and you need them to engage with it in many cases. And so if you're finding ways to engage, even if they have some weaknesses that your important audience likes like this is good and maybe you create you know you correct for as many weaknesses as possible and you're trying to create the best thing that you can produce maybe you explore other things that are similar to this that have fewer weaknesses or different ones but at the end of the day you know if you need to influence the important people above you you need to find ways of doing that that they like <laughs> and that's that's the truth of it they also help in player team comparisons like the overlays are really useful and again getting a quick interpretation of not only style but you know how does this compare to another team how does this compare to their own team uh, Mohamed Salah how did he look different in his Roma period where he was a bit more of a creative wide player versus his Liverpool uh, first season where he was just like you know the the god of scoring goals impressively So it comes back to knowing the audience um, and your likely audience has a huge impact on the choices you make and how you construct a visualization. For example, I'm gonna make completely different choices creating something for a group of statisticians or the people in this room uh, or like a scholarly journal than I would for a group of coaches. Um, and that comes back to like who is statsbomb.com's audience 
Uh, for us at the time, it was the public and the, the analyst community. So we're we're writing things that you know the public needs to be able to interpret hopefully as we grow, and the analyst community you know it needs to be good enough so that they're not going to pick it to bits and maybe you can teach people as as part of the process, and then we come back to actual stats about MyQ which is our analytics platform and who what is that audience, and that audience is team analysts first and foremost. We also work with a number of coaches that actually like to use our platform which is pretty cool. Uh, the front office we have uh, an owner or two that that logs in regularly to check on things. Uh, whether it's you know trending or how did the last game look or you know I've got these names from my scouting department that they like and let's take a look. I, plenty of owners actually get pitched on players themselves, so sometimes they want to take a look themselves. Uh, and then the public, so like we still do stuff on social media, and yeah, they're they're a different. They're a different level of audience than they used to be, but they're still part of it, and we still do plenty of things. Um, you know, statsbomb.com. All of the writers have access to IQ now, and so they're able to produce this analysis that hopefully you know, teams would be interested in, but certainly it's, it's a public-facing uh, site now. Notable fans of radars. One guy who's not Brad Pitt uh, said, I actually like him. They make players easy to understand, even for an old troglodyte like me. Um, and then the, the dashingly handsome gentleman on the right uh, named Anchorage Man uh, he also is, is in favor of radars. Um, so, you know, there are other smart advocates for this data visualization style. It's not just me out here standing for silly radar plots. Um, you know, uh, hopefully this has, uh, has helped change your opinion that radars aren't bad. They're just misunderstood. And how we use them is very different than a lot of people on the outside would think. Um, you know, in plenty of cases, like I'm sitting inside of the numbers, whether it's in the database or in a spreadsheet, and that's really how we do a lot of our research and analysis. But when we need to convey that information back to, to non-numeric audiences, we need to have a good way to do it. So radars are mostly misunderstood. However, the design choices that you make really matter way more for something than something like bar charts. Probably. So this is a credit to, to Danson one, um, and this is after I, I sort of pushed back on some of his, his Viz stuff and said, why don't you try this? And this actually was something I designed uh, for IQ uh, about a year before, which is basically doing sort of joy plots or, or, or distributions inside of kind of bar charts and, and letting people look at them. Uh, that way, we think it's actually really quite cool. Um, and I suspect that you know, when we get a little more development cycle, we'll take some of the stuff that you see currently on radars and we're going to move them over here because right now, I think recent versions of radars are, they contain more contextual information than I might want. Um, we were looking at it and saying, radars really want you to, to have good or bad things on them. Like that's part of the area idea behind it. But maybe if we can leave just good or bad things and take the context and move it off to the side, then I put it in something like this, then you get to have like sort of a better constructed visualization that, that sort of matches both sides of what you want. So you get shapes uh, of things that you understand and that are important. And then you get a lot more information because like really, you know, in the early days of football analytics, we didn't have that many metrics that we really cared about or even things that we understood mattered for different player archetypes and templates. But now we're getting more and more and you've added more uh, stats that people think matter or might matter. And so we're at the point where we've kind of filled up that, that visualization, like it's got 11 spokes. If you want more than 11 spokes, what do you do with the extra ones? And there are plenty of positions that we think, you know, are, you know, might need 20 spokes uh, or, or 20 things, but you can't add that to the radar because it gets really big and junky. So, you know, putting something like this alongside of it with still the distributions and the joy plots or, or things that are like joy plots uh, might be a way that we, we fix that long term. So with the right choices, radars are easily digestible and an attractive method of presenting data to casual audiences. They're also a fast way for experts to get quick impressions on performance and through loads of use and feedback inside of outside of soccer slash football. Uh, we found that radars open doors and start conversations in a way that almost no other viz type could. And this is something that we have explored and starting conversations in this sport, much more so than, than like for Daryl or 
you know, baseball or whatever, which, you know, they've kind of had their, their analytics revolutions and, and Daryl could just fire a coach and, and, and that doesn't like the stats and, and so be it. But like, we don't have that opportunity. We have to open conversations with people who've never seen this type of stuff. And we're still making inroads to find, you know, coaches and clubs and teams that want to be able to incorporate stats and data into their their process some do it in little ways some do it in much bigger ways but you know most of the time even now you know five years from when i i started this like we're still trying to to start the conversation and say hey this is a better way this is why it's better let's talk to you and that really matters for us all right, and that's it. So thank you very much for your time. I hope you enjoyed this. Obviously, this is my contact information if you want to get in touch. Uh, until then, thanks for listening, and thanks for coming to StatsBomb. Tell people if you like it, and you know, feel free to tell me if you don't. Bye.